evening. So um, welcome everybody. I'm excited to be um, talking for you today. Um, we're going to be talking about native plants. And so if you have questions, um, just pop them in the, the chat box and um, Carol and Caitlin are going to help monitor that for me because that chat box disappeared on my screens. So, but anyways, going forward, all uh, right. So one of the questions I always like to ask people is how do you define native plants? Um, we all have a different um, thought or idea of what a native plant is. And sometimes we look at it as a very generalist or a very general term. Is it just native to North America, which includes three countries and quite a bit of land? But then we start narrowing down what is a native plant. And one of them is, is it just native to the United States? Or do we just go a tad bit further and do we look at a geographical region? Do we look at the upper Midwest? Um, are these the plants that we want to talk about? Or are you a purist that just like plants that are from Iowa or Nebraska, but you just want the plants that are growing in those states? And most hort oh, did I skip a page? Nope, I apologize. Nope, I didn't um, skip the page. All right, another thing that a lot of times we um, don't take in consideration are these hybrids that we're developing, do we consider these native plants? Do we take what we have over here, the uh, purple comb flower, and that the, we've hybridized it to these double comb flowers? Is, so do we think this plant, is that double flower a native plant? What most horticulturalists define or botanists will define a native plant is usually a plant that is growing in the wild at the time of scientific collection. So that's kind of how we look at what a native plant might be. So again, we're looking at a plant that was growing in a space or geographical region at the time of scientific collection. In general, when we define native plants, we want to be looking at plants that are native to a region. And this is what we consider the Midwest or the upper Midwest. I like to add this line in because a lot of times um, the eastern sides of North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska are all climates that are very similar to Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Uh, because again, when we're looking at this, we're looking at an area that has the same amount of um, precipitation, a very similar soil type. And so um, we can add just um, the eastern uh, sides of those states. When we talk about native plants, I like to talk to people about or explain expectations, because a lot of times we have romanticized this notion that um, all we have to do is throw down some native wildflower seed in our backyard and voila, we have this beautiful um, lush um, um, grassland. And in reality, a lot of us, this is what our backyards look like, um, that um, our backyards are pretty much barren, that all we have is turf and some trees and nothing else. This is what Iowa once looked like back in the 1800s. Um, all of that light green is actually a um, prairie. Um, and then we also have some um, of forest savannas and crops, but um, predominantly the state was a prairie state. And when you look at it today, it's pretty much all agriculture. Almost everything has been converted over to agriculture. And um, so we have um, eliminated most of the prairie plants or the prairies in our area. And um, take a moment and write this down. Um, Carol David, she works with the prairie conservation in Missouri. And if you ever get a chance to pull up her YouTube or her TED talk, about prairie, about why prairies matter. And it's a very inspirational um, topic and she does just a wonderful job explaining why prairies matter and why those plants matter. And we're gonna be talking about those plants in here in just a minute. Again, going back to the expectations, not all native plants make a great uh, backyard plant. Um, 
if you recognize this plant, this is poison ivy. Poison ivy is native to the Midwest. I mean, look at that fall color. You can't beat that burgundy reds and orange. Just stunningly beautiful. But let's be honest, we don't want this in our backyard. And not all native plants are pretty. This is one of our, um, not yellow, green milkweeds, which is native to the Midwest. And um, right now, milkweed um, is getting all the publicity, but we're just limiting ourselves to the, um, oh, what are they? Uh, the common milkweed, the butterfly milkweed, and the swamp milkweed. And we have about nine other species that do very well here. So not all native plants are pretty. And we also have this con um, misconception that native plants are resistant to a lot of our disease diseases. If you've ever grown Minardia or bee balm, you know that it can get um, powdery mildew really, really bad. And so not all native plants have less diseases. And then also, um, native plants don't have superior growth. Um, I mean, sometimes we think like the redbud, the eastern redbud, uh, the Omaha area is kind of on that verge or that um, northernmost area of red buds. And as you go further north from Omaha, they kind of just really start disappearing from the landscape. It's not saying that they can't grow in northern areas of Omaha, but they just tend to kind of um, be short-lived or they succumb to um, environmental issues. And one thing that we often forget about is that native soil, I mean, urban soil is not native soil, that we have manipul um, not manipulated, um, destroyed, that's the word I'm looking for, most of our native soil through um, compaction and through um, um, agriculture means. And then when you buy a house, what they do is they strip all the soil away from you and then they sell, offer to sell it back to you. So again, not all native, um, not all urban soil is native soil. And one of the things about soil that I'll just touch on very briefly, it takes hundreds of years to develop um, topsoil. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. And we'll talk about that just briefly at the end of the program. So we're going to talk about the beauty of native plants. Uh, we love our native plants. They're just stunningly beautiful. They offer a lot for us. And one of the things that they do is their root system. Here is the root system of just about a dozen different native plants. And this one right here is the love plant. But if you look at the left of the love plant, that is Kentucky bluegrass. So we have a plant that can have a 14 foot root system. And then right next to it, we have incorporated bluegrass that has a root system of maybe six inches. But when we look on the far right of the screen at buffalo grass, that has a root system that can actually go down eight feet. So um, I think I have, yep, here's another photo of that. That we tend to think um, or incorporate non-native plants and we try to make them grow here, which we know that they can really struggle whereas our native plants have a root system that can really tap into the moisture at, um, when we go into droughts. So they have a big advantage over some of our introduced plants. Not all introduced plants are bad. We'll talk about that here in a minute, but um, native plants just can really offer a lot. And what we don't um, also appreciate, sometimes our native plants, not sometimes, our native plants' root systems will act as a conduit to allow water to percolate into the soil. So um, those deep root systems really help get that water down into the ground. All right, this is just another photograph of, the, um, of those roots um, hanging down from the soil surface. I like to show this to people because sometimes we forget that uh, plants live in a three-dimensional aspect, but, we don't, but all those diagrams are in two-dimensional, that these plants are, that are growing next to each other, their roots are growing next to each other, so um, we often forget um, when we look at all those two-dimensional um, photographs. We're gonna start talking about plants, and one of the things I wanna talk about are trees. Uh, we want to have sustainability. We don't want to just settle for the quick, fast-growing tree. Um, the 
Autumn Blues Maple, stunningly beautiful fall color. It is such a deep red, beautiful tree, but it's hugely overplanted. And are we creating another perfect storm for a insect or a disease to come through and wipe out the um, maple tree? Um, it's one of those great philosophical questions, but are we just making another um, um, perfect storm coming up? So let's look at the hickories. The hickories are native only to United States. They're not native to any other country. There is one um, hickory that does grow in Europe, but all the other hickories can only be found in the United States. They're not a mainstream tree because they have been deemed or classed as dirty because they drop something, that their bark is exfoliating or they have that nut that drops in their landscape. Um, they don't like compacted soil, so they can struggle in a urban area, and they don't like salt. Um, so they're not a great street tree, especially in areas that get a lot of snow and they have that salt um, slush that we have to deal with. The bitternut hickory is a very tall tree. We're talking about 70 foot tall. It's half that in spread, so about 35 feet wide but it's a great shade tree. Now, obviously it wouldn't be a front yard tree, but um, this is something that you could put in your backyard and it does make a nut. The pignut hickory is another tree that um, is about maybe 60 foot tall in the urban landscape that probably might reach 50 foot tall. So it's a nice tree to consider. It does have a nut, but the wood is really strong. It's actually stronger, stronger than steel and that our settlers would use the wood for their wagon wheels. We know the pecan, this is an edible fruit or edible nuts that we can incorporate into our landscape. Nice looking tree, has really nice fall color. And then we always go back to the shack bark hickory. Um, if you've ever had the chance to go down to um, Arbor Lodge and the Mead Lodge in Nebraska City, they have some amazing stands of um, um, shack bark hickories. Uh, just a beautiful tree, but people don't like them because they are dirty. So us as plant people, master gardeners and gardener professionals, we need to help people get over that whole dirty aspect of trees. The next group of trees I want to talk about are the oak trees. They are the dominant tree of the Midwest, but they are that the regeneration in the forest settings have started to decline. And we're not sure what's going on here. Why are we not seeing that forest regeneration? But we want to talk a couple, talk, ugh, got tongue tight. I want to talk about a couple different oak trees that you may not have heard of or you may not know that actually grow here. And the first one I want to talk about is the blackjack oak. If you want a red fall foliage, the blackjack oak is a great tree for you. So you can bypass the, uh, the autumn blaze maple and look for a blackjack oak. It's a smaller oak tree. We're talking about maybe 30 foot tall. The spread is going to be about the same. Great fall color. The leaf doesn't really look like an oak tree, and it has some really nice looking bark. Um, so you can get this whole four season of interest um, throughout the landscape. The shingle oak is the next tree um, that the leaf looks nothing like an oak. It almost looks like a willow, um, willow leaf. Um, you know it's an oak because it makes acorns, but those acorns are black. And it has a nice orange, I call it orange, it might be more of a brick red fall color. So it's a good looking tree. It is a taller tree, but um, if you want an oak tree that doesn't look like an oak, this is a tree for you. And then the post oak. Uh, this is not a mainstream horticulture tree. Um, it is um, considered by some horticulturalists or forestry professionals as a scrub oak. Um, it doesn't have a really nice pyramidal growth, but it is a tree that does well in this area. And then the chickapin oak. 
this is becoming more popular in the horticulture stream. Um, it has that nice burgundy fall color, but then if you look at the leaf, it looks nothing like an oak tree. So you can really have some diversity among the oaks in your landscape if you have the space for them. Other deciduous trees to think about is the black gum. This is um, a great looking tree. Um, it has fantastic fall color and it does well in our area. And I like to point out that this is in my front yard. Um, the black gum is just doing very well in the front yard setting. And it's a smaller tree. We're talking maybe 35, 40 foot tall, but um, it can be the same width and spread. So that's going to be interesting to see this tree as it matures. How wide does this tree actually get? The tulip tree, which I'm sure a lot of you know about this tree, is Nebraska's second largest tree, uh, or tallest. The sycamore is the tallest. But the tulip tree, if you want a quicker growing tree uh, that has a unique leaf shape that does flower, uh, the tulip tree might be a good tree for you. Oh, one thing about the tulip tree, like I said, it is Nebraska's second tallest tree. You need to give it space. I mean, this can easily top off at 80 feet in an urban landscape area. In a more open space, it can easily hit 100 foot, if not more. The cucumber tree is the magnolia. Uh, what's so wonderful about this tree is that it has great looking flowers and then after those flowers um, get pollinated, they leave behind these bubblegum shaped um, fruits and a lot of times we'll get calls as master gardeners or, or horticulture professionals that I have this tree with all this bubblegum on it, what is it? And that is our magnolia or the cucumber tree. It is a taller tree, it's not like the Soster's magnolia or the butterfly magnolia. This can easily hit 40 foot tall and have about a 20 foot spread. And then we can't forget the Osage orange. Um, it is a tough, strong wood, but you get those, um, um, you get the uh, oh, hedge apples on those trees. So those could um, hit you in the head. So you gotta be careful about those. So, all right, do we have any questions? I see, yes, I see some chat. All right, uh, yes, uh, one of the questions, uh, where can we find these? At the end of the um, um, talk, I will give you some resources where you can find these trees, um, where you can find them and, and purchase them so you can put them in your yard. So that is a great question. Uh, the size of the tulip tree in an urban setting can easily hit 70 to 80 foot tall. Um, in a more open space, a more rural or prairie urban setting, it can easily top off at 100 feet. All right. Uh, the size of the Osage orange, that's going to vary. That's going to be a wider tree than a taller tree, 25, 30 foot if that, but we're looking at like a wide tree. So we're going to have a tree that's going to be 20 foot tall that can easily have a 15 foot, 20 foot wide spread. So it is a wider tree. All right. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about perennials here. Uh, this is what most of us know and enjoy. We don't want to settle for the quick and easy. Um, uh, as we work with clients, as we look at plants, a lot of times we think uh, we want that maintenance-free landscape that we don't have to do anything. And that's nice, but um, we need to diversify our landscape. Um, 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 day lollies have a time and a place, but we, we tend to overplant everything that we like. In a prairie ecosystem, um, it's predominantly grasses, and so 80% grasses and 20% other um, species. Um, I am a numbers per person. I like sharing this. Um, these are the top five families of flowering plants. The aster family is the top with 23,000 known species. Then we go to orchids, beans, the matter, and then the grasses. 
So we're going to talk about some, some of those plants that you might not know about. So let's take a look at them. A lot of us know about the wild violet. Um, we might get calls as master gardeners or as a homeowner, we're trying to get those out of our landscape because we consider them a weed. Um, but there's the prairie violet. This has a deeply lobed leaf. It's almost like a fern-like plant. It has that gorgeous purple flower that blooms in the spring. And being that it's a violet, it can spread. Even our wild violet, it's a native plant to um, the Midwest, and um, some of our butterflies depend on that plant for um, uh, the larvae host of the fritillarian butterfly. Lithospermin, or hori pukun, is a short to the ground perennial, so we're talking maybe 18 inches off the ground, but it has these darling tubular orange, not orange, yellow gold flowers. Um, it does great here and our pollinators love it and um, they kind of reminds me of the habit of a milkweed but um, it blooms much earlier, has just beautiful flowers and it does well in our neck of the woods. The prairie turnip is a plant that um, you would have you would really need to be into plants. Um, it is something that um, is in, it's in the pea family, so it does uh, put nitrogen back into the soil, but it doesn't have a lot of ornamental value, but our pollinators absolutely love it. And um, what's fun about it, it does make a turnip. It, it's an edible um, root. Um, I've heard it's not very tasty, but it is, a, um, it is something out there um, that you can consume. All right, where did my chat box go? All right, our next. Oh, there it is. All right. Then we move to purple local weed. Um, great purple flowers. It's a taller plant, so um, maybe, I don't want to say taller plant. It's a, uh, the flower stalks are taller than the plant, uh, maybe 10 to 12 inches off the ground. Has that great purple flower. But if any of you have horses, this is a plant that you would not um, put in your landscape because it can, um, it can be poisonous to livestock and horses, especially horses. Then we have the wild licorice. This is a, um, another plant that's in the bean and pea family. It has that um, tubular type flower. It's white. Um, it's not really showy, but our pollinators like it and it mixes well with our taller ornamental grasses. Then we have the prairie, pop, prairie poppy mallow. You might know the rose poppy mallow, but this is the prairie. It has a very white or maybe a very light pink blushed flower. It's close to the ground. It almost grows more like a ground cover than um, anything else. If you do decide to grow this, be warned that rabbits really like this plant. So this can be a little bit of a challenge to keep rabbits from eating. And then we have the silver leaf scurf pea. Um, flower isn't anything to really write home about, but what's really nice about this plant is the foliage. It has that um, silvery foliage. So in the summer, when we don't have something in bloom, we have that nice texture to work into our landscape. And then we have the false Gromwell. Uh, this is a native plant to the Midwest. Um, it is in the Borage family. Um, it's a taller plant, so we can, um, it gets up to maybe two foot tall, and it has a really unique looking flower that a lot of our butterflies are attracted to. Skeleton weed. This is a plant that looks like more like more like a weed than a flower. It's in the aster family and um, it has no leaves. The leaves have been greatly reduced to kind of like little scales on the stem of the plant. And the stem has taken over for all the photosynthesis so it's, um, it's a really interesting looking plant. Um, either you're going to like it or you won't. And yellow star grass, um, just a 
super cute, low growing perennial. Um, if you're looking for that burst of color in a lightly shaded area, this might be a plant for you to um, look for. And then the hawk mead. Um, people usually pull this out of the ground because we consider it a weed because it looks like a dandelion. Just because it looks like a dandelion doesn't mean that it's a bad plant. Um, it's a taller plant and this is something that would appreciate growing next to a shrubbery or ornamental grasses, but it does have that dandelion type flower and um, it doesn't spread. Um, it's not an aggressive plant, but um, we need to help um, the people that we work with and just ourselves how we um, define a weed and an ornamental plant. And then the dotted blazing star. Most of us know about liatris. There are quite a few different species out, of, out there. The dotted blazing star grows more like a candelabra where you have the central plant and then you get multiple stems growing out from it. And then so you can get lots of flower spikes off of one flower. And um, it's just a really tried and true perennial that does well here. All right. Going to talk a little bit about a little bit about some of the familiar favorites that you know. Uh, this is the partridge pea. A lot of people think of this as a weed, but it's a great perennial. It, it is native to the Midwest, and our bumblebees absolutely love it. It has gorgeous yellow flowers, and it almost looks like the sensitive plants if you've ever played with one of those before that um, these leaves do react to touch, so they can close a little bit, but um, it's a fun plant to try. Then we have the lead plant. Uh, the lead plant is just a great plant to incorporate into your landscape. When it blooms, it just has a nice contrast of those orange, um, orange yellow stamens, and then the purple or magenta um, um, flower petals. It's in the bean family, so it does help put nitrogen back into the ground, and it has good sturdy stems, so you don't need to stake it. The compass plant. What's so amazing about this plant is when it grows out of the ground, um, the basil leaves will align itself to north and south. So that's where the name comes from, is that those bottom leaves will always align north and south. And um, it's in the sunflower family, so you get that bright yellow color. It is a tall plant that um, it might need staking in the um, landscape. Horia vervain. Um, some of us might consider this a weed, but it's a great plant to consider keeping. Uh, those flower spikes are super attractive to our um, native um, um, native pollinators. It's a taller plant, well, not taller. But um, we're talking about 18 inches tall, but it has that nice lavender color that blooms throughout the summer and um, our insects just really like it. Spiderboard. A lot of us know spiderboards. We have two species that are native to the Midwest. The Ohio spiderboard is just one of them that um, it's a grass-like foliage. Um, it does really well here. It's one of those plants that can take what locations. And um, once it's done flowering, you can always deadhead it because some of the complaints that we receive about this plant is that it looks ugly or untidy when it's done, um, done being in flower. Goldenrod. Um, Goldenrod um, is just, it's Nebraska state flower. You just can't say enough nice, nice things about it. Uh, the great goldenrod is a good alternative to the hybrid of um, fireworks. If you've ever grown fireworks goldenrod, you know that plant can really take over. It can take a four by four footprint out of your garden. Whereas the gray goldenrod is much more well behaved and um, it doesn't spread as aggressively. The gray headed coneflower, great looking plant, but this is going to need staking in our garden. It's a prairie plant that co evolved with the grasses, so it needs to be planted with ornamental grasses next to shrubbery 
or you're going to have to stake it. And then the Western ironweed. Uh, there are several species of ironweed uh, found throughout Nebraska and Iowa. Uh, bright magenta fall color, I mean fall full, not fall foliage, magenta flowers, thank you. Um, it does great here. Um, strong sturdy stems. Um, so if you have a plant that like the gray-headed coneflower, this would be a good plant to plant along the side of it because this might help keep it upright. Ironweed gets its name because if you ever try to cut it or take a wood, weed rocker to, to it, it's not coming down. Rattlesnake Master. Uh, this is a plant that you're either going to like it or you're going to hate it. Um, the first time I grew it, uh, my neighbor thought I was growing thistles because that foliage is just very um, um, angular. Uh, it has lots of not little neat pokey things on it, and uh, when it flowers, it looks kind of like um, cotton balls versus a traditional flower. And the rattlesnake master is in the carrot family. And our carrot family plants are pollinated by flies. And one of the calls that I get every summer is this plant that people think it's being attacked by flies, but in essence, that's the pollinator. Here's the green milkweed again. Um, like I said earlier, um, the um, butterfly milkweed, the common milkweed, and the swamp milkweed are getting all the press. We have nine other species of milkweeds that are out there that will do great in our landscape. So don't limit yourself to just um, those three. All right. We're going to talk about a couple plants that defy cultivation that are not going to be growing in their backyards because um, they have just um, they re require really specific um, 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 set of settings for them to be successful. The western prairie orchid. When we think of orchids, a lot of times we think of very tropical areas. I mean, yes, Nebraska can feel like the tropics, but we don't think of orchids growing in Nebraska. The western prairie orchid is an endangered plant. Um, uh, they are heavily um, working on conservation efforts, but um, unfortunately, agriculture has removed a lot of their favorable spots. The nodding. Nodding Lady Tresses Orchid. What's really interesting about this particular orchid, it's only pollinated by two species of bumblebees, and those bumblebees are endangered. So um, we need to um, conserve both the plants and the insects, but um, this is a great looking orchid that does well in shaded locations. And then we have the White Lady Slipper Orchid. Again, another tropical plant that you don't think would be growing here in Iowa or Nebraska. And then we have the showy orchid. Uh, this does um, well in forested areas. It is becoming less known in the wild because we have, um, um, unfortunately, a habitat destruction, but um, this is another orchid that does um, grow here. And then the star lily. Uh, the star lily is a plant that does very well on the western um, side of, the, um, of Nebraska. It's a plant that grows pretty much in sand. It, it's a plant that only tolerates maybe 10, 10 inches of rain a year, but um, it's one of those plants that looks great in the wild, but don't dig it up, don't try to bring it home. All right. So now what? Um, so what do we do to help improve our landscape to be more successful for our native plants? Um, one of the things that we can do uh, that's a struggle down here in the Omaha area is we have very clay-like soil. And one of the best things to do, you've heard it multiple times, is to apply compost, to mix compost in. Cornell University did a 12-year study of this uh, process that they called scoop and dump. It's where they put eight inches of compost on top of heavily compacted soil 
and they just fractured the soil. They just took in a backhoe and they, or they just spaded in the compost just to get that process started. And what this does is it just really speeds up that soil process, improves the drainage, and they've had great success with um, the plants that they put in this area. And so what we can do as homeowners and gardeners is incorporate compost into our landscape. If it's a new flower bed, spade in that compost, and then every so often, every maybe second year, you can just put a layer of compost on top of the soil. You don't have to mix it in, just put it on the top of the soil, and that's going to improve the soil texture and improve drainage. When we decide our plant selection, it's nice that these, we have these new hybrids that are coming out, but one of the things that we don't consider, oh, great question from Lisa. What do you mean by compost? A compost is going to be um, a plant material that's going to be broken down. So think of um, starting your own compost pile or going to your favorite garden center where you can just get that organic material and, um, <clears throat> and where you can incorporate it into the ground. So grass clippings, leaf litter um, would be um, organic material. But anything that we can do to just help get that um, organic material back into the ground. Uh, when we're talking about uh, flowers, uh, we want to um, keep in mind that some of these hybrids that are coming out might have a negative effect on the native stands of our plants. So think of our double cone flower. This pollen, if it does produce pollen, can have a negative effect on the, our native stands of cone flowers. So we want to be mindful that um, um, these even though that this is a hybrid of a species that um, we can have a negative impact on the native plants. So instead of going with the new hybrids, um, stick with our tried and true perennials that um, are natives that have just uh, do wonderful here. Um, I always like pointing this out that there is over 4,000 native bees to North America and most of them live in the ground. Um, so when we are um, thinking about our flower beds, make sure that we leave some bare soil to act for those native um, um, pollinators to have access to soil. This I'm going to leave up here for you just for a couple of minutes so you can write this down. Um, these are um, uh, nursery centers that where you can go and find plants that some of these plants that I talked about um, and you can purchase them. Uh, the Great Plains Nursery, the second one down, is here in um, Nebraska. They are located just south of Lincoln. And this particular nursery is they go out and they collect the seeds from the trees. So we know that we are getting trees that are adapted to the Midwest. And so that's really um, exciting. Uh, the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum is an excellent source um, to include for um, our um, uh, plant sources. Then Prairie Moon, Prairie Legacy, and Missouri Wildflowers. Oh, thank you, Carol, for including those into the chat box. Oh, and there is the Los Hill. Yes, so there are wonderful places that you can get uh, native plants. So thank you, um, Carrie, for including uh, the Los Hills um, plant cell. So there's just a lot of good resources um, because a lot of these plants won't be found in uh, mainstream um, um, horticulture or in our garden centers. Briefly, I wanted to talk about plant, um, um, not all introduced plants are bad, but um, for every thousand, I mean, you can read the numbers on the screen that um, 
plants can um, uh, grow out of their space. A lot of us have grown what is it called bishop weed or snow on the mountain. We thought it was a good plant. It's like, oh, this is something that's great for the shade, and then it takes over. But two of the plants that I really want to talk about quickly is the calorie pear and the amur honeysuckle. These are two plants that are becoming invasive. The amur honeysuckle is a big issue here in Douglas and Sharpie counties. It's really taken over our understory areas in our forest, and the calorie pear is escaping cultivation. And so Illinois is having a big issue with the calorie pear. And um, again, Illinois is having an issue with the amur honeysuckle. And that you can see where there's um, uh, counties throughout both Iowa and Nebraska where this is becoming an issue that we're trying, we're having to deal with. One of the things that uh, we're doing to help manage invasive plants is that the Ohio Invasive Plant Council, they, um, they reached out to their botanical gardens um, and they asked their um, care readers what plants are escaping their um, cultivation and or um, growing out of their boundaries. And one of the tree, first ones that came out was the Amur um, cork tree. It's a beautiful looking tree, but it's spreading. And one of the things that we're trying to do is work with um, uh, our growers and our industry professionals is let's stop these plants making it into the trade uh, and let's prevent them from becoming a problem. The Iowa Department of Natural Resources um, right here that they have an invasive plant list. You can just look it up um, online. You can um, Iowa invasive plants. So if you're in Iowa, this is a great um, resource to find out what plants are um, um, we should not be planting. And then for the Nebraska folks, we also have the Weed Watch. Uh, this is a um, 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 another great resource to find out what plants are escaping cultivation. So um, um, you can go online to, um, to either of these sites to get a good idea of what plants you should not plant. And I want to end with this. Um, this is our backyard. Uh, when we think about plants, um, of gardening, a lot of times we're in a hurry, we're in a rush that we want to have a that instant gratification. Uh, we bought our house in July of 13. We had horse weed that was growing up to our ankles and um, if you've ever had to deal with horse weed it can be a challenge. But we did get it under management. Um, mowing can really take care of it. And we had to decided to keep this new bush because it hides the power box back there. Um, spring of 2014, Mother Nature told us something different. And what this did is that um, we had to take care of our new bush because it, that's the wrong color. And what we did is we just started sticking plants in the ground. Uh, we, um, some of our um, cone flowers, um, oak leaf hydrangea or minardia. 2015, it kept expanding because we're both plant people in this house. We both like plants. 2016, our neighbors behind us took out some trees, which really opened up the opportunity to plant more. And so I'm sure you can all relate. Then this is 2017. And then 2018, everything was filling in and looking good. Oops, but I went too far. Darn it. Anyways, I missed the slide. All right, I apologize. But anyways, um, going the right direction, I just wanted to um, end with this quote um, with, about native plants. Um, they grew without irrigation, they grew without hose, they grew without fertilizer, pesticides, or lows. So native plants can um, really offer a lot to our landscape and hopefully you can start trying one or two to see what might work for you but might not and talk to your neighbors um, to see what works for them. But um, 
I am going to open it up to any questions at this time. While people are typing their questions into the chat box, um, I did include a link to the speaker evaluation that you guys can fill out. Um, so it's just the second to the last one there in the chat box. So please feel free to jump over there and fill that out for us. Yes, with, um, thank you. Uh, but Gardening, it's a it's a journey. It's never it's like a, a never ending. Um, uh, uh, it's a never ending program. It's something that we always add. We're tinkering. We're t adding. We're taking a, adding plants. We're taking plants out. So just have fun with it. And my contact information's on the screen. Um, uh, almost all of extension, both uh, both sides of the river, we're working remotely but we are available. We are here to answer those questions. So please um, feel free to reach out to us. For smaller trees, yes, it's always a challenge. And um, there's not, um, for smaller native trees, you could look at like the blackjack oak, the post oak, those are the smaller trees. Um, you might have to hunt around to find them. Um, and when I mean by smaller, I'm talking about maybe 30 foot tall. Uh, the black gum is another smaller tree, maybe reaching about 30 foot tall. All right, are there any fruit trees that will thrive in Omaha? Um, uh, the persimmons, uh, that does well. Um, um, Nebraska does have a nut guide on uh, fruit trees for Nebraska. Um, so you can always go online and look for, um, I forget what that nut guide's called, but you can um, go online and look for fruit trees for Nebraska and type in like Nebraska extension and that should pull up the, um, the nut guide. Yes, Osage Orange, something, thank you, um, Linda. Osage orange does produce thorns, so that can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, and one of the things that we can do is um, take out the turf grass and put mulch around the tree. So I don't know how much space that might be, but that could help alleviate getting um, um, pricked or um, stabbed by your tree. Uh, from Kirk, um, recommendations for a shady spot. Um, are we talking about perennials or um, for perennials? Yeah, that would have to be perennials. Um, there are a couple, and if you wanted to shoot me an email, I can give you a list, but um, there is Culver's, Culver's Root is a perennial, does well in the shade. Um, thank you, Carol. Um, Culver's root does well in the shade. Uh, there's another one called blood root that does well in the shade. Um, goat's beard. So there's a couple that are out there, but feel free to email me and, and I can give you a more comprehensive list. Any other questions? Like I said, please reach out if you do have those questions. Um, Carol knows how to get a hold of me, um, and, and there it is. So um, I'm, we're working remotely, so I would love to um, talk to you about plants. So um, it helps keep um, our minds occupied, and hopefully the weather will cooperate where we can start getting outside. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, I just wanted to say a reminder to fill out that evaluation in the chat box. Um, I just sent the link for it again in there. Uh, thanks again so much for coming out. If you guys have any other questions for Scott, feel free to send him an email. It's in the chat box or you can get a hold of uh, myself or Carol and we can get that information for you. Join us next week. We'll be here both at 10 and at 3 on Fridays and tell your friends. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you.